The Senate Committee on Health Policy and Human Services is called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Vanderwall? Present. Senator Bison? Senator Johnson? Senator Lasada? Senator McDonald? Senator Tice? Here. Senator Brinks? Here. Senator Hertel? Senator Santana? Senator Voino? Here. Mr. Chairman, you have five members present. There is not a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I know that we have a couple that are stuck in traffic and they'll be here shortly, so we will wait for a motion to adopt the minutes. Today we are going to continue with a testimony from last week on House Bill 4348. And first, uh, via Zoom today, we have uh, Eddie Garcia, who is the Director of Pharmacy for Spartan Nash. Uh, Eddie, if you're here, uh, whenever you're ready, uh, you should take over the screen and we appreciate your time today. The floor is all okay. yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Chairman Vanderwall, members of the committee, uh, my name is Eddie Garcia. I am the director of pharmacy for Spartan Nash, a Fortune 400 grocery retailer and distributor headquartered in Grand Rapids. I'm here in support of House Bill 4348. I want to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to address you re regarding this very serious uh, issue. In my role, I oversee the operation of 86 corporate pharmacies, 59 of them uh, are licensed in Michigan. I also oversee a buying group that consists of our corporate pharmacies along with 170 affiliated pharmacies, which are independently owned and operated. 69 of those are in Michigan. Combined, our corporate and affiliated pharmacies fill tens of thousands of prescriptions each week for Michiganders. Along with filling prescriptions, our pharmacists provide medication counseling for an untold number of patients each day, whether or not we fill prescriptions for them. We strive to provide the best medical outcome possible for each patient's condition. Our pharmacists are available days, nights, and weekends to provide this service. During the pandemic, our pharmacies even expanded home delivery to deliver to assist patients who needed to avoid contact with others. Our pharmacists also administered tens of thousands of COVID immunizations while working on the front lines during this pandemic. President Biden has said several times that because 90% of the U.S. population lives within five miles of a pharmacy, Pharmacists have been able to administer millions of COVID vaccinations. What if that weren't the case? We need to imagine how differently this pandemic could have gone without the level of pharmacy access, because today, many pharmacies are at risk of closing due directly to the anti-competitive behavior of PBMs. PBMs have reached a size and scale that gives them a tremendous unparalleled influence in determining the price and access to prescription drugs. Allow me to paint just a, a little bit more detailed picture. As you know, DIR fees are relatively new in our industry. In 2015, the DIR fees charged to Spartan Corporate were significant, over $7,000 per pharmacy, over half a million dollars in total. Keep in mind that these were brand new fees that just started being uh, charged a few years earlier. Now, fast forward to 2021, we expect to pay over $108,000 per pharmacy or over $8 million in total. That's a dramatic increase in just six years. Using that same ratio, if you took, if you had a gas or a, a hamburger that went from $7 to $108 in just six years, I think most fair-minded people would consider that some sort of price gouging and a need for regulation would be uh, determined. These astronomical fees undoubtedly contribute, contributed to Spartan Nash closing corporate stores in West Branch, Coldwater, and Kentwood. We had independent pharmacies owners that in the last couple of years also had to close stores in Montague, Kalamazoo, Southfield, Flint, Mayo, St. Helen, Ferrysburg, Belding, and Howard City. Unfortunately, many of these pharmacies are located in rural and urban areas where patients don't have as many options for pharmaceutical care. In many cases, the pharmacist is the closest clinician and the one the patient interacts with most frequently for healthcare. Many of the independent pharmacies in our buying group have voiced serious concerns about their viability if we don't do something about these DIR fees and the unfair competitive practices. Another reason to regulate the PBM industry is that PBMs operate pharmacies. That vertical integration that they have when it's used to disadvantage a competitor has to be regulated. Many PBMs, especially the large ones, own mail order pharmacies. These mail order pharmacies compete with retail pharmacies in the network. The PBMs that go so far as to design the prescription plan to send more mail order to send more prescriptions to their mail order pharmacy. Some PBMs own retail pharmacies, so not only do we compete with the mail order, we now have to compete with the retail pharmacies across the street from us. To make matters worse, 
worse, the PVM gets to set our reimbursement rates. They get to determine how much we pay in DIR fees. They potentially can put us out of business. You can't get more anti-competitive than that. House Bill 48, 4348 also mentions transparency of PBMs, which is needed. You've heard that, that PBMs require rebates from manufacturers upwards of 40% to put their medication on formularies. If those medications aren't on formularies, the manufacturer's sales for that medication significantly drops. And so they pay it. You didn't hear that from the CVS representative last week when he, talked, when he was asked how PBMs got paid. He didn't mention manufacturer rebates at all. It's unknown because of the lack of transparency how much of those rebates go to the employers, but it's estimated that it's no more than 50% on average. PBMs create market share agreements. You also didn't hear that from the CVS rep. What they do is they basically uh, work with the manufacturer to improve their market share. And if they do, they earn fees. So just imagine a scenario that you've got a patient that pays for a prescription, they pay for their copay. You've got the employer that pays for the benefits that that patient uses. And the person or the entity that benefits in that from that transaction is the PBM from the market share fees. They did mention uh, spread pricing. So they charge the employer more than they pay the pharmacy. PBMs use service fees to enhance their revenue. While the rate of increase in the DIR, DIR fees has slowed in the last couple of years, the increase in service fees has jumped significantly, as I believe the PBMs anticipate future regulation of DIR fees. These are just some of the things we know that PBMs are doing to increase their profits at the expense of pharmacies and consumers. Pharmacy payment for, per, per, uh, pharmacy payment for performance, which you've also heard, heard about, per event hasn't increased in the last six years while DIR fees have skyrocketed. You did hear a couple of weeks ago from a PCMA representative that no one has to hire a PPM. I think uh, CVS rep mentioned it last week as well. That was the most relevant comment each of them made. No one has to hire them. They are completely non-essential to healthcare and yet they pull millions if not billions of dollars from it. They are a true middleman and only serve to create profits for themselves, which I don't begrudge any company for trying to earn a profit. But when they do it to disadvantage their competitor, I do have a problem with that. If PBMs truly were concerned with care, they'd adjust the payment to pharmacies to increase to achieve the medical outcome desired. Instead, they raise the metric goal each year in order to keep ahead of the performance achieved by pharmacists in order to increase their own profits. There's not even a goal that can be achieved to reduce their DIR fees to zero. That's not care management, that's profit management. If PBMs continue to operate without regulatory oversight, Healthcare costs will continue to rise for consumers, and we may begin to see pharmacy deserts in rural and urban communities with fewer pharmacists available to patients. The quality and accessibility of their healthcare is at risk. Therefore, Spartan Ash and the independent pharmacies we represent strongly support legislation that requires regulation of PDMs and pricing transparency. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you letting me speak to you today, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much for being here, committee. Any questions? Uh, Eddie, just one, and I, I appreciate you being here, and, and unfortunately, in, I see one of the stores that you closed was in my district in West Branch. Um, again, rural community, what, in what cases, how many of these stores that have closed, what, what options have been left in the community? Are there still pharmacies available, or are we starting now to see pharmacy deserts throughout the state? Well, in, in this particular location, we did sell to a, a competitor. Uh, so basically there's there's one less air, place for people to go. They'd have to travel a little further for their prescriptions. Uh, they, they, just the, the access to pharmacies or to the pharmacists themselves gone, has gone down. As you know, you know, as pharmacists, we develop, and I am a pharmacist by training, um, we develop relationships with our patients. And, you know, we get to know them, we get to know their medical issues, we get to know their families. You know, we, we do actually uh, become part of their healthcare team. And when you take that person, even though another pharmacy is available, it's not the same. It's not the same thing. That pharmacist, you know, is the one that they're used to dealing with, who knew all the information. And when they're no longer available to them, that, that care access really takes a hit. And the last question I have with... With the transparency piece with the PBM, do you feel that uh, this will hold them in check, that there potentially wouldn't be as many fees, or do you feel that there is a possibility they'll just come up with a new way to, to pass fees on to the pharmacies? 
Well, I, I think that the service fees is is what they're using currently in anticipation of that. They've gone, they were pennies per claim and now they've gone up significantly. Um, they, they will find a way to try to do it, but the transparency would at least be a start. If you regulate them, you at least have some, some teeth to say, hey, wait a minute, this is an unfair business practice. You know, why, why do I compete with, with them and they get to determine my payment? The, the amount of prescriptions that, that we sell to a patient that's not on some kind of a prescription plan is, you know, four to six percent. I mean, as, as an industry, there, there's nothing, I can't pass on any of these fees to the customer because my, my reimbursement rate is set by contract. So I can't pass that to anybody. We have to eat that, uh, that any, any losses. And you'd be shocked to know how many prescriptions, how many millions of dollars that we sell that we either lose money on or make very little to none. Very good. Thank you very much. Seeing no other questions from the committee, we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Dominic Pallone and Christine Shear from Michigan Association of Health Plans. Appreciate both of you being here today. And uh, whenever you're ready, if you can light up your mics, the floor is yours. Good morning, Chairman Vanderwall and members of the committee. My name is Christine Shearer. I'm Deputy Director of Legislation and Advocacy for the Michigan Association of Health Plans. With me today is Dominic Pallone, MHP's Executive Director. He will be highlighting some of MHP's concerns with the legislation before you today. Our association represents 10 health plans serving over 3.2 million Michigan citizens in the Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial product lines. We also have 55 business and limited members. I'd like to take a moment and thank the chairman and committee members on your due diligence, not only in regards to this bill, but the whole House bipartisan health care package. The number of stakeholder meetings you have held on the entire package uh, not to mention this bill alone, which I believe you indicated, Mr. Chairman, you've had 87 meetings on House Bill 4348 alone, is unquestionably more than your counterparts did on the entire package of bills as it raced through the House. MHP would like to acknowledge all the work your members have put into this legislation and also provide some amendments that we believe will make uh, this better public policy. Employers and health plans utilize pharmacy benefit managers as an essential component in the administration of prescription drug benefits. Thus, while we support some of the additional government oversights of these entities in the way of licensure, regulation, and the limitation of gag clauses, MHP is opposed to House Bill 4348 as it passed the House. MHP members offer comprehensive coverage under the pharmacy benefit for prescription drugs delivered through retail, mail order, and specialty pharmacies. Health plans also provide coverage under the medical benefit for physician-administered drugs, biologics, and devices in outpatient and inpatient settings. This gives health plans a unique perspective into the pharmaceutical supply chain, working in coordination with our contracted pharmacy benefit managers, as well as pharmacies, physicians, and hospitals to ensure that enrollees have coverage for the treatment and services they need. As this committee explores the role of various participants in the supply chain and how that impacts the cost of prescription drugs, a key fact missing is that the entire process, pricing process is driven by the original list price of a branded drug, which is determined solely by the drug manufacturer. As Christine stated, MAHP and our member organizations support the legislation, the components of the legislation that establish state oversight through licensure of, and regulation of PBMs and codifies federal gag clause language. Those areas are things that we can find common consensus around. However, we believe in its current form House Bill 4348 goes far beyond these key transparency components and would have significant cost and uh, financial implications for healthcare purchasers throughout our state. Recently, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the NAIC Model B Committee, or B Committee, excuse me, of which Michigan is a member, uh, uh, DIFFS serves on that committee, 
approved model legislation aimed at these fundamental components of meaningful regulation and transparency of PBMs. And I'd urge, as this committee continues to evaluate this process, that it takes a look at that model, which is currently moving through the NAIC process, to make sure that there's uh, consistency in regulation for these valued negotiators. MHP has previously provided members with a revised redline version of uh, House Bill 4348 and our suggested um, amendments that are in there. I'll take just a moment here to highlight several of the major components uh, that we've previously shared. Um, first, um, we would suggest that there's uh, additional clarity to the PBM rebate reporting to include data only for Michigan and not national rebate information. I know uh, Senator Bison at a previous hearing uh, had an opportunity to ask the sponsor of the bill if that was her intent, and I believe the committee testimony indicated it was. However, that was an issue that was pointed out in the House and was not fixed there, so we would encourage the Senate to fix that language uh, as it's working on the, the bill here. Um, second, we'd suggest deleting language that requires the PBM to notify a patient 60 days in advance um, for cost-sharing changes, which is found in Section 15, unless the drug manufacturer is also required to provide notice of drug price increases 60 day in advance of the drug price increase. Um, we feel it's only fair that if our industry is given advance notice, then we can provide advance notice when there are drug pricing changes. Uh, it should not be the responsibility of the PBM to determine patient cost sharing obligations, but rather is the responsibility of health plans to do so. Third, uh, we would recommend changes to Section 17 to include provisions for mail order pharmacies and specialty pharmacies um, to be allowed to continue as they currently operate today, as well as including definitions for specialty drugs and specialty pharmacies, uh, which could be found or should be found on page seven. Uh, currently, the bill in its form limits the ability for purchasers to select mail order or exclusive specialty arrangements. Um, by prohibiting this, you will drive up costs for large group employers that often turn to these um, tactics as ways in which to create increased access to their drugs at a lower cost. Um, State of Michigan retirees, for example, use such arrangements and large and small group insurers throughout the state have chosen these mail order um, uh, processes as ways to keep their overall costs affordable for their members. Um, next, we'd suggest modifying language throughout the bill, identifying PBM uh, pharmacy network as a pharmacy retail network. Uh, and we'll note that currently the retail network is not yet defined throughout the bill. Um, we are also concerned similarly here with um, language on page 15, subsection 2. Uh, and we need, we would prefer that, uh, that there is an allowance here for plans and their PBM partners to still allow for the use of networks, however, still ne uh, necessary to meet network adequacy requirements. Um, but we would, uh, we would suggest some new language in Section 17 uh, to ensure that customized networks could still be delivered. Um, also, we would suggest modifying language um, to addressing quantity limits or refill limits to allow for the ability for these mail order and specialty pharmacy programs to continue to operate as they do today. Many employers, as I noted, uh, suggest or request that their employees select uh, mail order uh, as a means for providing robust pharmacy benefit coverage to their employees at an affordable price. We'd also suggest the deletion of references to aggregate fees PBMs receive in the rebate reporting in section 23. Many plans pay administrative fee services for uh, PBMs. Um, which is very different from a rebate, and we do believe there is adequate um, language in the bill which would require Michigan-specific rebate information to be disclosed. We would suggest the modification of language addressing DIF's annual review of all claims, which can be found in Section 23. A review of all pharmacy claims would be a significant and unrealistic burden for our state uh, to undertake and would likely be at a large financial expense as DIFs would likely have to increase its size considerably in order to review all pharmacy claims in the state of Michigan. A random audit of sample claims would be more realistic and aligned more with how pharmacy audits are conducted today. Uh, we would suggest eliminating Section 27, which dictates government rate setting. 
uh, for prescription drug costs. This is the section we, some of the previous testimony in previous days referenced uh, NADAC pricing, which is a, a national um, acquisition cost. Uh, it's important to note that NADAC pricing is not used in all programs or in all markets, and it removes the flexibility for employers and payers to determine the level of pricing uh, concessions on drugs that meet the, uh, their availability to provide comprehensive yet affordable benefit design. Um, NADAC in particular is a voluntary database that pharmacists may send their information and their invoices uh, on cost to. Not all do. Large chain drug stores often choose not to report to NADAC and the data does not include off invoice discounts that are often provided to the pharmacies themselves uh, which do result in different reimbursement rates that can be higher or lower than the actual acquisition cost. If not removed, and I want to be clear on this point, uh, this one is a large cost driver. If not removed, this language will significantly increase healthcare purchases, uh, healthcare costs for healthcare purchasers. Um, there was some testimony in previous hearings related to studies done in Ohio um, referencing NADAC pricing, and I believe um, previous testifiers had, had noted or at least inferred that NADAC plus a dispensing fee would somehow equal savings uh, for ratepayers throughout Michigan. The results are known in Michigan as we've switched our uh, Medicaid program to a NADAC plus dispensing fee model, took effect October 1st of this past year. In the state budget for fiscal 21, the estimation for that change, in addition to ingredient cost changes regarding the shift to the single PDL, was estimated at $91 million in additional costs just for the Medicaid program. A report has been filed with uh, um, your, your uh, colleagues over in the, or in the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee as well as the House Appropriations Committee for an update, mid-year update, on how those uh, estimates have actually been realized. The report states that an estimated $102 million in addition to the $91 million already allocated is needed to cover costs at a minimum for this current fiscal year for Medicaid because of the shift. So I want to be clear, shifting to NADAC does not equal savings, and the experience in Michigan has been that it has equaled considerable expense increases for the Medicaid program. Uh, the Couple more here that we would suggest uh, modifying language in section 28 dealing with pharmacy audits, uh, secondary to provisions to requ uh, required under CMS pertaining to fraud, waste, and abuse requirements. Uh, we understand there's considerable concern about the audit practices of uh, these valued negotiators um, as they work with their network pharmacies. We simply need to ensure that audits are not blanketly prohibited. There are certainly needs and requirements by federal law and should be requirements at state law that audits can still be conducted, especially for the purposes of finding fraud, waste, and abuse in the system. We'd suggest modifying language, uh, again, addressing the mailing of prescriptions found in Section 29 to ensure that pharmacies do not bill patients for costs unless the patient has agreed prior to the mailing. And we would, uh, finally here, we would suggest clarifying language uh, in the bill pertaining to PBM, uh, quote, indirect contracts with pharmacies through one or more intermediaries, uh, defining the intermediaries as PSAOs, or Pharmacy Service Administration Organizations. Uh, most states' PBM effort reforms in, in recent years have defined PSAOs. They are an important part of this uh, drug chain. They they often do um, negotiate prices on behalf of independent pharmacies and can uh, drive up costs or drive down costs depending on their influence. Um, we would simply suggest that this legislation look at licensing them, regulating them, similar to the aspects of a PBM. Out of control prescription drug prices are a direct consequence of pharmaceutical companies taking advantage of a broken market for their own financial gain at the expense of patients. The lack of competition, transparency, and accountability in the prescription drug market has created extended price dictation monopolies in antitrust competitive practices with economic power that exists nowhere else in the U.S. economy. 
The end result is that everyone pays more from patients, businesses, taxpayers, to hospitals, docs, insurance companies, and pharmacists. In summary, MHP members are committed to ensuring that patients have access to medications that are safe, effective, and affordable. While we support transparency in the prescription supply chain, we want to stress that House Bill 4348 will not lower the price of prescription drugs. This bill does not get to the ultimate driver of high drug prices, nor does it lower the manufacturer high list prices, nor limit manufacturer price, drug price increases. The bill as currently written, however, will add cost to employers and purchasers to accommodate the prescription drug benefit design for their employees. Thank you for allowing us to share our perspective on this important legislation. MHP stands committed to solving the drug cost crisis as we look forward to continuing to work with the Senate on House Bill 4348. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions members may have. Thank you. Question, Senator Tice. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony today. I just wanted to clarify uh, a few things. Uh, when you were, uh, Dominic, when you were speaking initially, you talked about codifying federal gag clause language. There was, there were, um, there was a law passed with respect, in this space, a little over a year ago, I think, at the federal level. When you were talking about that, you're not talking about codifying the allowance of gag clause, but in fact, codifying the prohibition. Exactly, yes, exactly. Codifying in, a, in an equal language to the federal language so that we're mirrored uh, federal language, a prohibition on gag clauses, yes. Okay. Um, and I, I agree with you that this is an entirely broken system. The more I get into it, the more complicated it gets, which is, uh, it, you know, government, right? Um, actually, and free market in this one. So what I'm seeing are like two parallel tracks. The PBMs are contracting with the manufacturers. Meanwhile, you've got the uh, pharmacies contracting with the wholesalers, and it's kind of crisscrossing, the system seems to me to have been um, kind of shoved together and then band-aided to make it work and everybody keeps coming up with new solutions to the problem they see. Is there any state that's actually looked at a complete overhaul of this process? Well, I, yeah, I'd hesitate to say a complete overhaul. I, I, I would say from our perspective, a complete overhaul has to start at the list price. And, um, and states have been taking a look at what they can do to um, create greater transparency for where that list price for the manufacturer sets that list price for the drug. It's at the top of that supply chain, right? So, you know, we've seen some moderate successes of states as they've cast greater sunlight into that area, having um, manufacturers better explain some of their costs of research and development, some of the things that are perhaps already financially filed, but are hidden in SEC filings or other areas where you and I don't know where to look, right? For, for the, or your average constituent wouldn't know where to look. So we would suggest, you know, that that is perhaps the, the first and best place to start and where we've seen some successes by other states. But I, I would hesitate to say that there's been a wholesale reform. I mean, we've seen no state ban PBMs or PSAOs or wholesalers or anything like that to try to remove in some way uh, chains in the, uh, in the dispensing area. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Santana. Good morning. Thank you for your testimony. I just had a quick question. You mentioned a little bit about random audits. Do you have a methodology behind having random audits versus just, cons you know, consistent audits? So. Um, for, from the state's perspective, having DIFs do a randomized audit or having a plan do a randomized audit? I believe you were referencing DIFs. Oh, yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. In my testimony, I was, um, you know, we, we would want to work with the department to find uh, a happy medium. I think my whole point is the, the way the wording is written currently, it would require the department to audit every pharmacy claim that comes in. And I think... It, nobody is auditing every claim that comes in, so I, uh, we, we would just try to look for something that's more realistic on, on when those random, random audits would be. Now, I, I would suggest as well, and we see it in the health plan space, as we are audited by our regulators often, 
there, there should be announced audits, and, and we've suggested some language from a PBM auditing practice down to a pharmacy practice to better announce those audits and, and hold true to those audits. You do need to have, in some cases, an element of surprise where you suspect fraud is occurring, perhaps. You might not want to announce an audit, but for a DIFF's perspective, we would suspect that would uh, ideally be announced and um, an easy process is what we're seeking there instead of requiring the department to audit every claim in the state. And then I had one other question, Chair. Absolutely. Um, and then also you mentioned a little bit about the projections from appropriations standpoint that you know, the last fiscal year for Medicaid, it was around 91 million, and then this year is around 102 million projected. Um, is any of that relevant to the fact that we just, you know, we've been through a COVID pandemic and there's an increase in Medicaid applicants um, in the process? Is that what is a portion of that, that or? Yeah, that's a great question, yeah, uh, Senator. And yes, we have had an increase in the Medicaid enrollment um, and Healthy Michigan enrollment utilization of the pharmacy benefit was actually depressed along with utilization of most medical claims. As people stopped going to their primary care doctor, for example, they stopped getting prescribed uh, maintenance meds, unfortunately. It's a big issue that we will have to grapple as we go forward trying to get that return in utilization. But no, the, the, um, the cost estimate changes that are occurring um, have been normalized for that seasonality that occurs over time, but also because of the pandemic. And it's actually, it's, it was 91 million built into the fiscal 21 budget at the front end. The boilerplate report that just came in to the, to the uh, uh, appropriations committee calls for an additional 102 million to the current fiscal year. So it's 193 million. That will continue as we go forward. So that will be built into the base and there should be built into the base in fiscal 22. Um, it is hard to separate how much of that is just ingredient cost, I mean, it's all ingredient cost changes. There's also dispensing fee increases that are another 34 million in increased cost per year for the, for the fiscal year. Um, but it is hard to separate how much is because of the shift to the single PDL, um, where perhaps we are now forced to prescribe more brand drugs rather than generic drugs, and that ingredient uh, cost goes up versus how much is directly attributed to switching to a NADAC pricing as opposed to MAC or WAC pricing. Um, in some cases, that switch at the individual drug level, that NADAC price might be an actual lower amount on an ingredient cost than where that pharmacy was being paid before. But predominantly, and a vast majority, is a much higher price than what they were being reimbursed before. And I have one last question, Chair. Um, you mentioned the MADAC pricing is not, it's a voluntary system. Um, what are other pharmacies using as far as their, you know, uh, I know you mentioned it's more of a voluntary system, but is there another system that people are using, like uh, the big box pharmacist, or yeah. as far as reporting, I, obviously that's not something that's required, but. Right. Um, it's a little outside my area of expertise, okay. yeah. but I'll try my best here maybe to answer. Yeah. Um, there. If you want to get back to me on it, it's fine. We can do that. Thank okay, you, Senator. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Uh, seeing no other questions, I do appreciate you being here and your suggestions. I look forward to working with you uh, further on this. But just one, one burning question. We all know that ultimately throughout the last several years, the, the concern is the cost of prescription drugs to the consumer. Of course, you being in the health plans, it's also a cost to you and it's a cost to businesses. What, what would be your estimate and what has happened in other states that have made some of these changes uh, to increase costs to the, uh, the actual consumer and to the business that's providing the, the uh, benefit? So we, we've seen no other state go as far as the language in this bill. So I want to be clear about that. It's very hard to get an apples to apples comparison because there is so much beyond just the core transparency and regulation that other states are embarking upon. Um, when you do transparency and regulation of the industry from what we've seen in other states, when, they, when they've done it in a manner where it's not creating, you know, uh, very high and, and uh, costly new processes to be done. Um, you know, an example previously was state of Texas, now requiring public disclosure of its rebate information at an aggregated amount 
linking also uh, how much is going to the, the patient, how much is going to the plan, how much is staying perhaps with the PBM. Um, to my knowledge in Texas, that has not driven down costs by doing that. It has created greater transparency, and I think there's some value in that for policymakers, for the public, and for others, but uh, we have not seen premiums suddenly drop in other states that have passed transparency, and, and we have not seen uh, costs go down in any state that have done some of the further steps that this bill seeks to do, quite the opposite, where we've seen cost increases occur. And, and again, the, the best example I have is Michigan on the NADAC pricing, because we have a real example in our Medicaid program that has driven up costs considerably. Thank you. Thank you very much for both of you being here. We appreciate it. We look forward to working with you on the bills. Thank you. Next up via Zoom is Scott Pace from the Arab American Pharmacy Association. Uh, I appreciate you being here. I will say right now, it's 10 after 9. Our goal is to get done before we go into session today. So if we can make things uh, tight and precise, we would greatly appreciate that. With that, Scott, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the op opportunity to be here with you via Zoom today. Uh, as you mentioned, I am here uh, on behalf of the Arab American Pharmacists Association to uh, give you some of the experiences out of the state of Arkansas who wrestled with uh, these the similar type issues back in 2018 when I served as the CEO of the Arkansas Pharmacist Association and went through many of the same issues and uh, challenges that you, you all are, are debating today. So just wanted to give you uh, the perspective of what led to the licensure of PBMs in Arkansas in a very comprehensive fashion and to show you some of the data that caused the state to um, get behind some of the limitations on PBM practices in, in, in that state. And I will try to be as brief as possible, Mr. Chair. So in t at the beginning of 2018, uh, the PBMs were, at least in the major health plans in Arkansas, operating in a fairly transparent manner leading up to January of 18 on a voluntary basis through the relationships with their health plans. And those health plans at the beginning of 2018 moved to a spread model from a transparent fee-for-service model with the PBMs. Um, this created a different revenue stream for uh, the PBMs, uh, and, it, and the spread model, as you've heard, uh, is basically an amount where the uh, PBM charges the health plan, including these managed Medicaid plans, an amount that is greater than is paid to the pharmacy. Um, and the PBM keeps, keeps the difference in the middle, which might not sound like a bad um, markup kind of model until you see really what they do in an unregulated fashion when they have control of both the pocketbook and what they pay uh, the provider on the other side. In Arkansas, when they did that in 2018, that change jeopardized patient access because it threatened pharmacy survival. Uh, and it led our legislature uh, to, uh, to, to pass comprehensive PBM regulation, what I would argue is probably the most stringent uh, in the country. Here's an example on the next slide, uh, if you still have those slides in front of you, that says at the top, Arkansas case study facts continued. As you can see here, we were able to obtain data from patient explanation of benefits and to do those claim audits, as was suggested by the previous speaker, to determine whether or not what was charged to the health plan was actually paid to the pharmacy. And in one of the most egregious examples, which I've put on this slide, uh, a drug that is an old fashioned uh, antipsychotic medi medication, the health plan was billed $1,005 uh, and 37 cents, I believe, is that number for the medication, while the pharmacy was only paid a grand total of $431.81 for the same medicine. So the PBM spread, which they often make it sound like it's a minimal number, was $573 on that one single prescription. And those prescriptions are being processed every minute, every second of every day by the pharmacies throughout the state, that created a really perverse incentive for the plan sponsors to be charged more, which in theory they should be concerned about, but we'll talk about maybe why they're not here in a minute, and to pay the pharmacies less because doing both of those creates a bigger spread for the PBMs. And in the first three weeks of 2018 in Arkansas, when this spread was under, uh, uncovered through these explanation of benefit audits that I, that I just spoke of, the PBMs kept more in spread per generic prescription than the pharmacies were paid for actually buying the drug 
going at risk for the drug and providing the service to the patient. That spread in the first three months, or excuse me, first three weeks of 2018 in Arkansas was over $22 per prescription in hidden spread dollars. And I will tell you that the state of Virginia, uh, I know West Virginia presented last time, but in, in Virginia, um, they did an, an audit of their managed Medicaid plans on spread uh, around the same time and found that their spread was approximately $23 per prescription uh, in, in their managed Medicaid plans. So, you know, why you should care about uh, spread, and I consider effective rate, which is the new version of how PBMs do spread today, instead of doing it on a claim level, they do it on an aggregate level. You should care about spread because it's directly related to increased premium rates and capitation for health plans. Whenever claims get artificially elevated, like that $1,000 prescription I showed you earlier, even though um, 470 of it is what was paid to the pharmacy, those, that data is what's used to justify the, the new rates for, for rate payers the next year, whether it's premiums in a commercial plan or whether it's capitation that they come to the state management or Medicaid program to ask for a new capitation for their managed Medicaid plans. That matters a lot. Um, it, the spread should also matter because in that particular example I gave you earlier, the, the provider who is actually doing the service was having dollars extracted away from them um, for actually doing the service. And in, in that particular case, that, that pharmacy lost money on that prescription while the PBM was paid, paid themselves essentially through spread more dollars than, than, the, than the provider got paid. And then the other piece that is, is important is medical loss ratio manipulation. We could go into a complete another d discussion on that. But when you look at the percentage of, of a premium dollar or a capitation dollar that health, can, health plans are allowed to keep in administrative fees, using spread and effective rates allows them to manipulate that number for the purpose of hiding administration fees in clinical claims. And that's a problem uh, on many levels. There, there's one other you know, uh, competitive piece that I think is important about one, one of the pieces of what your law is trying to do and Arkansas's law has, has uh, now tried to button up. And that is um, uh, the, the, the anti-competitive practices slide that, um, that hopefully you have in front of you. Um, during that same time period, we didn't just evaluate spread in Arkansas. We evaluated the, the fundamental competitive problem that exists in the PBM world, where the PBMs get to set the rates for the pharmacies that they compete with. And we were able to look at a comprehensive list of over 270 uh, top generic medications that were used in the state to see what one of the major PBMs who owns their own retail pharmacy outlet paid themselves for the exact same prescriptions uh, that they set the reimbursement rates for for the independent ph pharmacies. And what you can see is uh, uh, there's four specific examples on that list, but if you look at the aggregate of those 272 claims, this major PBM who owned their own retail pharmacy paid themselves on average over $63 for, per prescription for the exact same prescriptions that they were cutting the reimbursement rates to the local pharmacies down to the bone. So that anti-competitive uh, uh, practice was also addressed by the state legislature. And, and I should note that it, at the exact same time that, um, that, that, that they were paying themselves $63 a prescription more than they were paying the independents, they sent letters around to independent pharmacies in the state of Arkansas at the exact same time saying, hey, we know times are tough in your state. Pharmacy reimbursements are getting cut to the bone. Would you like to sell your pharmacy to us? We'll tell you what it's worth. So at the same time, they're taking a knife uh, and cutting the reimbursement out of the bottom. They're trying to come in and buy the pharmacies on the cheap to eliminate competition. That's a fundamental flaw uh, in, in, in the system as it exists. And our licensure bill, comprehensive licensure bill, address that. So let me just say in summary, and then I'll be happy to take any questions. Arkansas's comprehensive law put put not just regulation and oversight on the PBMs, but put prohibited practices on the PBMs. Uh, we passed that comprehensive licensure in 18. Um, our Arkansas Insurance Department now has the ability to comprehensively license, regulate, uh, sanction, which we've done uh, with one of the major PBMs. Our insurance department issued a $50,000 fine for some noncompliance to one of the big three PBMs uh, in the last year and a half. Uh, spread pricing is now completely illegal in Arkansas. Effective rate payment is now illegal in Arkansas. 
PBMs paying their own pharmacies a higher amount than they pay their other network pharmacies is illegal. Those pharmaceutical rebates are reportable uh, to the Arkansas Insurance Department by the PBMs. Uh, and plans are required to meet network adequacy standards. And I think it's important to note, someone mentioned earlier about network adequacy on retail. Our network adequacy is broken up into both retail and mail order. We got to make sure that, that patients have real access, uh, not just access through uh, a mailbox, which is, which is access to drug. It's not access to care from the pharmacist themselves. Um, and all of these requirements, and we haven't really talked about today, the Rutledge v. PCMA case, which is, is a sentinel case from the U.S. Supreme Court uh, from December of last year, all of the, the, the requirements uh, have now been able to be expanded on PBMs as it affects uh, reimbursement rates as a result of that Rutledge v. PCMA decision. That, that decision fundamentally gave you as a state legislator the ability to impact reimbursement rates in self-insured plans uh, in, in your state. Uh, and that's a pretty clear decision. And that was an 8-0 decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and the upshot is, is there has been no evidence in our state that it has increased overall cost at all. And we're three and a half years in, into that law. Uh, and, and just recently, our legislative audit committee in Arkansas released a finding saying that while there are still concerns uh, in the PBM industry, and there were a few examples where the PBMs were still not following the law, but there is now a, a, a much lesser degree of malfeasance happening as a result of this. Pharmacies are being treated more fair. Uh, patients are being treated more fair. And the system as a whole, to I think Senator Tice's point, uh, received a pretty fundamental overhaul uh, in this state whenever uh, real, real regulatory oversight was put on the pharmacy benefit manager industry uh, in Arkansas. So, so that's our experience. Uh, and we would expect that states that, that use similar legislation would, would experience a similar uh, outcome. And I know that your 4348 bill uses a lot, of, a lot of legislative language that is extraordinarily similar to Arkansas. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Scott. We're, we're going to take care of one quick piece of business, and there are a couple questions for you, so hold on real quick. I'm going to sure. ask that uh, we have a motion to adopt the June 24th, 2021 committee meetings, motion made by Senator Tice. Uh, without objection, the minutes are adopted. I just wanted to get that read in, so I know that we have a couple people that might have to scoot for another meeting. But with that, uh, Senator Lasada. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you tell me um, how it works in Arkansas? You said the spread is now illegal in Arkansas. So can you tell me how that works now? Yeah, it, it works like it used to work um, before the game started being played. Whenever there's an adjudicated claim at the point of sale, um, that's what the pharmacy is paid. So there is none of this coming back after the fact. Um, and taking dollars away from a pharmacy that they have no idea what they are. What, what they say is being paid at the point of adjudication is what is being paid. Uh, the only exception to that, Senator, uh, is in the Medicare program. That is uh, a, federal, um, a federal rule that dictates those, uh, excuse me, th those reimbursement practices. So that's the only place in our state that our state legislature hasn't been able to, uh, to oversee. Just follow up. Uh, yeah, just one more question. Um, are there any states where PBMs are not allowed to own pharmacies? That's a great question, Senator. I'm not aware that there is, is a state that does that. But I, I think you can see from the examples that I showed you what, what a perverse incentive uh, th there is uh, when you control both what you pay your competitor and what you pay yourself. Um, it, it's kind of the equivalent of Walmart getting to decide what Target uh, gets paid for their, their goods, you know. It's, it's perverse incentive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Tice. Thank you very much for your presentation today. I appreciate that. Um, I'm looking at the, uh, the slide that you have that has a comparison on the PBM-owned uh, PBM retail pharmacy and the independent pharmacy and the difference in the cost. Can you tell me uh, whether or not those were the same prices for the PBM PBM-owned retail pharmacy, are those the same prices that they pay all of their contracted pharmacies, regardless of whether or not they own them? Or is it only the ones that they own? No, these were only the ones that they owned. Uh, so, we did an analysis. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, do you have <clears throat> what they paid the in contract, but not, um, not 
owned by them. Do you know what that what those rates are? Well, on the, on the slide that shows that small little example of those four drugs, that those are the examples that were actually paid to those independent pharmacies for those drugs. The, the contract language, I think, is, is, is fascinating because contract languages are essentially terms that the PBMs make up. There are no real numbers for how much you're getting paid for the drugs except for a nominal dispensing fee. So when you see a term like maximum allowable cost in a contract, the PBM gets to manipulate that number from moment to moment, uh, day to day, and they get to make it different for one pharmacy versus another, which is what they've done in this example. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I think you alluded to this earlier. You mentioned that um, there hasn't been a real uptick in costs to employers. Do you all have data around that and what has been the conversation from those employers in your in your state? Well, we can uh, certainly work with the Arkansas Insurance Department to get you some specific numbers. I don't have those in front of me today, Senator, but I'm happy to work with you uh, to, to get those numbers. For, from an employer perspective, that's really an interesting question. You know, this, this legislative session, the, uh, the uh, uh, Rutledge decision, that allowed the expansion of, of these laws into the self-insured marketplace. Uh, that bill was run earlier this spring um, and the, the, no employers showed up to even testify against that bill that would have that codified the Rutledge decision. The, the state chamber showed up in, in one chamber to, uh, to oppose it, but no PBMs, no health, uh, no health plans, no uh, individual employers even showed up to testify. So, um, I'm assuming that there's a, a tacit okayness with that, but that's just an assumption based upon them not showing up to, to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other questions from the committee, thank you, Scott, for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Chairman. Yeah, before we move on to, I need a motion to uh, excuse absent members, being no objection. Motion is accepted. After that, we have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. We welcome Mark Cook. And uh, Tim Antonelli, Antonelli, I'm sorry, Manager of Pharmacy Services. Welcome to both of you. As you know, we're running into a time crunch, so um, short and sweet, so we can ask you lots of questions. I've been accused of being short, not always been accused of being sweet, but we'll try. We'll do our best here. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, good, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Cook. I'm Vice President of Government and Regulatory Affairs with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. With me is Tim Antonelli. He's a manager in our pharmacy services area and a vital member of our pharmacy team. Uh, on behalf of Blue Cross and Blue Shield and its more than 6 million members nationwide, we appreciate the opportunity to come before you today and discuss uh, our position on House Bill 4348. Uh, similar to uh, what you heard from Michigan Association of Health Plans, um, there are some aspects of this legislation that we do support. Uh, we do believe that some transparency and some licensure uh, relative to the PBMs uh, makes sense uh, for Michigan. However, uh, we have significant concerns with the bill, and as it's drafted, we, we very much oppose the bill. Um, we have submitted all of our uh, amendments, and so I won't go through all those in detail uh, in uh, interest of time, but they're very similar to what you heard from Michigan Association of Health Plans. Uh, we are the largest nonprofit mutual health insurer in Michigan, and we share the goal of uh, making sure that drugs are available at the right price at the right time for our members. We support those consumer protection pieces, but we also believe that pharmacy benefit managers are a vital component of the pharmacy pipeline. We partner with over 2,300 Michigan pharmacies in every corner of the state. We process over 27 million prescriptions annually, totaling over $3.5 billion in uh, pharmacy spend. And pharmacy spend is the very largest concern of all of our customers because it is increasing at, at a rate that is just not sustainable. So we need to make sure we have every tool available to us to try to help drive down those costs. And I'll also agree with um, the point that was made earlier that the price point that starts is the problem. Uh, what we're talking about right now is a lot of the contractual relationships between PBMs and pharmacies, but it kind of ignores the, the source. The source is the skyrocketing increases that manufacturers continue to, to put on drugs that are out there that you know they have patents on, 
it's like a license to just increase the cost. And Tim will get into some of those details in a minute. Um, so that remains one of our number one concerns, the prescription drug cost. We hope to see future legislation that actually addresses the rising cost uh, of that. And I know that there has been some discussion at the federal level. And because of the Interstate Commerce Clause, states have a bit of a challenge in trying to address directly that price point. Uh, but there are some federal discussions that, uh, that are happening that we, we, we hope. I also will just point out that there are exactly two countries in the world that allow uh, advertising on prescription drugs, and it's the United States and New Zealand. And if you can just imagine, I was watching NBA Finals last night, 700 commercials, you know, about these happy people dancing around looking all happy about the newest drug. And those types of things are really at a driver of what's at some of the court, uh, cost here. We're talking about some of the details around it, but uh, there are important details. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and we're going to talk about some of the, uh, the cost drivers for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Vanderwall and members of the committee. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be before you today. Um, so increasing pharmaceutical costs remain one of the single largest expenses for Blue Cross and creates a significant concern for our customers, especially given pharmacy costs now exceed even inpatient hospital stay costs. And with CMS forecasting drug expenditure to increase by $184 billion over the next seven years, this concern will grow as more innovative, expensive medications come to market. And in order to offer robust drug coverage, that is cost effective. Blue Cross uses various approaches when managing these benefits, and part of that includes strategies in which we partner with pharmacy benefit managers. In this PBM role, they help negotiate lower drug prices with manufacturers, create and manage pharmacy networks, provide claims processing services, and provide mail order and specialty services, and make available technologies that allow members and providers to have real time prescription benefit information at their fingertips. And given our work with the PBMs, there are certainly some provisions in the legislation that we support. Next one, please. Uh, okay. Could you advance for remarks? Sure. sure. Yeah, All it's right. It's a little tricky because we're using the PDF instead of the... All right. So thank you. So the, the components of this bill that we do support include state licensure requirements, bringing PBMs in line with the other health system requirements, the banning of the gang clauses, as we heard earlier. This aligns with the federal law that became effective in 2018, which Blue Cross strongly supported as we believe patients should know the lowest price of their medication. And we believe in transparent financial reporting for not only PBMs, but manufacturers and others in the supply chain as this transparency can be helpful to guide future policy decisions. And this PBM transparency aligns with the recommendations from the Governor's Prescription Drug Task Force in which Chairman Vanderbilt, you served, and we thank you for your work on this very important drug pricing issue. Next slide. We do have significant concerns about the unintended consequences this bill may precipitate. More specifically, there are provisions in this bill that could result in decreased quality for patients and increased costs in which the cost will be shifted to employers and to patients. While there are several provisions of concern, I will focus my comments on five key items. One particular concern is related to value-based payment design, where in Section 15 of the bill it would negatively affect value-based pharmacy programs, leading to downstream higher cost share for patients. Today, CMS has quality metrics that apply to Medicare Part D programs and directly impact a plan's star ratings and reimbursement. For example, key measures of these ratings are based on whether patients are taking select diabetes, cholesterol, and hypertension medications regularly. These measures were developed because CMS determined that patients taking these medications regularly have improved outcomes. Given the CMS quality focus, PBMs have created value-based incentive programs with pharmacies to support these Part D plans and encourage network pharmacies to engage in efforts to ensure members are refilling their prescriptions in a timely manner to have these better outcomes. So if provisions in this legislation were to prevent the operation of value-based pharmacy arrangements in Michigan, it could negatively impact patient outcomes and eliminate a mechanism for plans to earn high quality ratings. Importantly, health plans that achieve high quality ratings are required to, by CMS to pass the correlated quality bonus payments back directly to members in the form of reduced cost sharing, reduced premiums, and enhanced benefits. So if House Bill 4348 negatively impacts these Medicare programs in Michigan and it results in lower star rating uh, reductions, patients will pay more for their health care. Another concern we have is regarding spread pricing prohibitions in Section 17. This is concerning given that spread pricing gives plans predictability of drug pricing when providing drug benefits and can reduce the overall cost of offering such benefits. As well for our members, it can put the independent pharmacies on an equal footing as the price a member pays at a large chain can be the same as that at an independent pharmacy. For example, when I look at our pricing at a chain pharmacy in Manistee and an independent pharmacy in Ludington, the price for the patient is the same. 
And another concern that we have is the new reimbursement requirements under Section 27 that would require PBMs to reimburse at a minimum threshold of NADAC or WAC. NADAC is not a reimbursement methodology that is used in commercial benefits today. And it would be concerning if Michigan moved towards the type of pricing model, <coughs> excuse me, for commercial benefits. NADAC pricing is a voluntary pricing database used by Medicaid and is managed by vendors for CMS that sends a random monthly survey and receives responses from 1% or less of pharmacies in the United States. The database is not inclusive of all drugs, and about 7% of brand products do not have a NADAC. As well, because this is a voluntary survey, it allows the possibility for cherry picking of reporting pharmacies in situations where the current published NADAC pricing is higher than the pharmacy's current invoice price available. Thus, this pricing methodology has known flaws and it does not include off invoice discounts received by the pharmacy. Michigan moving to this methodology for commercial drug benefits could result in higher cost to patients and employers paying for prescription drugs, as we heard earlier. In addition, the prohibition on requiring the use of only PBM affiliated pharmacies in Section 19 is also concerning. These arrangements are offered to customers for cost saving options and should these arrangements not be allowed, groups and their members currently using these arrangements will lose this cost saving option. This is especially concerning of specialty drugs which often are only available from PBM affiliated pharmacies or only select few pharmacies because manufacturers limit the distribution. And because this bill creates impact uncertainty for plans that are serviced by PBMs on pricing, networks, claims processing, and our contracting, and knowing we are already planning and quoting business into the 2022 plan year, we would respectfully ask that the implementation date in this bill be no earlier than 1-1-2023. And one last slide. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Yep. And as we have raised concern with the potential unintended consequences of some of the provisions in this PBM legislation, I do want to express that we are grateful that there is a legislative focus intending to find solutions to lowering the cost of prescription drugs. That being said, I thought it would be good to share some information from a 2019 Pew report that looked at where dollars are retained in the drug supply chain, from PBMs to wholesalers to manufacturers and plans. So with that, I thank you very much for your time, and I'm going to turn it back to Mark for some final comments. Thanks, Tim. And <clears throat> again, in the interest of time, we won't go into a ton of detail, but I would just say that about two-thirds of our business is self-insured customers. So um, we are basically using our networks and contracts, including those with PBMs, to pay their dollars um, for, for their employers and our employees, rather. And that's that's really the, the bulk of, of the business. And so I'll leave you the, with this thought, I guess, is that the root cause of rising prescription drug prices are the increases set by manufacturers. PBMs are one tool that we utilize to try to help get some volume discounts off these exorbitant prices. We used to be our own PBM. We contracted uh, with a national PBM because of the discounts that they can get from the manufacturers that we share with our, our customers. So um, the bill would have pharmacies get paid more, as you've heard throughout the course of this, uh, not less, and the increase would be borne by our customers. So the bill has been billed as it was sent to you by the sponsors as a way to help reduce the cost of prescription drugs. And it's actually the opposite for us. It's going to cause us to pay more on behalf of our customers. And so uh, that's a concern. Um, we, again, agree with some of the uh, transparency and the licensure pieces of it. Um, I think transparency is always great. We have to do a lot of it ourselves. Um, but we're very concerned with uh, the overall direction of the bill causing an increase in cost for our customers. So thank you. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Questions? Uh, real quick, um, explain to me, I, 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 as we talk about the increased cost, and, and we understand the, the pharmaceutical companies or the, the pharmacies that where they're stuck, a lot of what we've had discussion in the last uh, several weeks through committee is the the fees that continue to be charged back to our pharmacies. How do we how do we look at solving that issue? What it, what's your suggestion of I mean you've been through this over at the other chamber and now here and over the years we've had plenty of conversations on this. What where do you see that opportunity and what can we do to to fix that model so that a 
the pharmacy doesn't get a charge back or a claw yeah. back or the and, DIR fee. And, and, and you know, we, and we do support, um, as I forgot to mention too on the gag clauses, we support the codification of the federal law. It, it already um, isn't allowed by federal law and you, you can put that in state statute for, the, for the, uh, that. And, and Tim has uh, dealt with a lot more of these contracts over the year, so I'm gonna have him you know, weigh in on that. I would just say, Everything in design, uh, benefit design, is moving toward these value-based contracting, right? So the, the different uh, groups have some skin in the game. Our uh, contracts with providers, both a hospital and um, uh, pharma, uh, uh, physician contracts, is moving more into a value-based design uh, model where uh, there's upside and downside risk for the, uh, the, the folks that we contract with, the hospitals, the, the uh, physicians, and the pharmacies. And I think some of what you're seeing with like spread pricing and some of those things are really uh, an extension of that value-based design um, so that there's uh, the opportunity um, to drive efficiency by, because the more efficiency they uh, get out of it, the more they can get out of the contract. But Tim, if you wanna weigh in on the, the way that it's evolved and, and what, what might work best. Yeah, and I think it's good to, to also just kind of step back a second and say, you know, CMS, uh, who runs the Medicare Part D program, years ago started these star rating programs. And part of that includes these measures for pharmacies related to how many times a person prescribes a prescription, how many day supply that they have, so they always have a day supply on hand. Over the years, this program has seen a significant jump in the, in the number of, uh, I guess, value that it's provided. So. A few years ago, for example, the diabetes medications used to have a, a, an average medication adherence rate of like 76%. Now they're at like over 83%. Um, so it's very competitive market in trying to make sure that the patients are getting the medications and they're having these better outcomes. That being said, plans like Blue Cross very much focus on these star ratings to make sure the patients in our programs are getting the best outcomes. And so we put a lot of focus on these programs and that is why these you know, programs that are value-based for pharmacies are extremely important because who is better than helping the patient pick up their prescription on a regular basis than our pharmacies? So they play an important role. And I know at the federal level, I wanna talk about this a little bit because at the federal level, the, the CMS uh, folks have already come out and said in regulation, in 2022, we want our plans to be reporting out all of their quality measures so that they're a public uh, record of what those are because they want to see consensus measures develop around this DIR type programs for pharmacies. And I believe at the federal level, those conversations really need to be had with the leadership so that we can have some consensus uh, as an industry as to what is good practices, what are best practices for this type of program. And I do understand the pharmacies that, you know, having to go back and, and claw back money after the fact, Perhaps there's some discussions around maybe there's a withhold up front and then a payment in the back end so that there's not the surprise. And I've heard that is so how some of the PBMs are looking to move in the future. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, and I think getting further into it, and I, I understand, I guess, you know, I understand where you guys are sitting too, but when you're looking as a, a small pharmacy and you get clawed back, I mean, we heard Meyer testify on this earlier and in, in several others we have the independent pharmacists from uh, my district that actually spoke so if they know that they're going to average x amount of millions of dollars of clawbacks every year in dir fees so if you, you figure out your prescription number and you put a fee on that to cover your your fee are you get you guys wouldn't pay that is that correct would you challenge that I'm just asking a question, and it's yeah. a direct, I can see that that's, I'm just asking a question here. Well, I, the dispensing fees are part of the contract um, that are, that, that we have with the, with the PBM, and so um, you're saying if they add a fee on top of that, would we pay a fee on top of the contract, and I, I, I don't think that's ideal for our customers, obviously. Well, and so. I understand that, but it, yeah. it, I think what, it, what I'm really getting at is that it's not ideal for them to wait 16 months to find out that they're gonna pay a fee that they initially right. knew they had no idea. And I think that's the discussion that becomes the issue for our pharmacies, and the other problem that goes with that is that if they disappear, you know that the rates will disappear and they'll go up. And the other problem goes is that they're gonna vastly affect those small ones that are in the rural communities. And I understand, and it's not a direct quote against anybody, sure. it's just yeah. we've allowed inside our business that these fees are being 
um, put on months down the line, and you know that I have expressed through the committee that point of sale should be point of sale. And they shouldn't be able to go back and, and dig back a fee. But I think it uh, warrants a lot further discussion. But uh, I, and I'm assuming that most of my folks that are on side of the, the committee here um, agree that, you know, we got to protect some of that for them too. And if it's an unknown, it is a, a crazy factor in the business of the pharmacy world. But I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, well, thank we look you very forward to, to continuing to work with you on very some good. discussion on how that might uh, happen. But I would just say that it's if if you simply add costs or you require higher reimbursement, somebody pays that, and that's generally our customers. And so, I understand. You know, and I, you know what? And I agree with you there yeah, too. Yeah. And I, it's somehow we've got to figure out where this is. But I appreciate Understood. you both being thank here. You. We've got one more person. I've got to get up because okay. he's in person. Right. So thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask John Gross, if, uh, Executive Director for Michigan Independent Pharmacy, if you could make it up, John. We have literally got seven minutes, and uh, so it's not a lot of time, and I apologize for that, but uh, um, we appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Senate Committee. Uh, Good morning, my name is John Gross and I am a pharmacist and pharmacy owner with three independent pharmacies located in Clare County and two pharmacies in Genesee County. And I'm testifying to you today on behalf of myself and as executive director of the Michigan Independent Pharmacy Association in support of House Bill 4348. And I urge you to pass this important legislation which would require pharmacy benefit managers to be licensed in the state of Michigan and also provide the much needed oversight to their business practices that ultimately affect the affordability and accessibility of the health care to patients in Michigan. And uh, MIPA represents the interests of Michigan's independent pharmacy owners who, as small business owners and pharmacists like myself, work on the front line face to face with our patients on a daily basis. We experience firsthand the death grip that PBMs hold over our business and we're all too familiar with the effects this control has on our livelihood as pharmacy owners. And this, in turn, negatively affects our ability to provide the level of service our patients deserve. If I could do the arrow, there we go. Um, Michigan is one of five states to have over 1,000 independent pharmacies in operation, with over 11,000 employees filling close to 60 million prescriptions a year and generating over $3 billion in total sales annually. Independent pharmacies are frequently the most accessible health care provider in Michigan's local communities. But while independent pharmacies play such a huge role in Michigan for pharmaceutical health care, Michigan is one of the last remaining states to have zero legislation passed with regard to PBMs. And you have uh, you've seen and read the literature and heard the testimony of others who have mentioned how much control a PBM, let me see, I'm going to go back to, uh, of how much control a PBM has on the pharmacy supply chain. In fact, over 95% of all prescriptions filled in the USA in 2020 were processed through top, the top six PBMs. In fact, uh, near 80% from just the top three. Two weeks ago, we heard testimony from, from Meyer, and I think they did an excellent job in laying out how PBMs are crippling pharmacies' ability to operate successfully. And they also mentioned how retroactive billing and the trend of increased DIR fees below and uh, reimbursement below costs on our drugs have led to an unsustainable model for them, and they've had to make difficult decisions um, that have affect um, their patients' access to health care and increased costs. You know, a few years ago, Maya was listed as the 26th largest retailer in the U.S. They're on Forbes and Fortune, and they have 119 stores in Michigan alone. But if a large big box store with 119 locations is testifying on their struggles with PBMs and an effect that it has on their patients and their care and costs, um, just imagine how 1,000 plus independent pharmacy owners are trying to survive on their own with the same issues. As a pharmacy owner, I feel the weight of those same struggles. But unlike a big box store, I don't have a super center or a grocery store to augment my sales. In fact, over 99% of my business revenue comes from filling prescriptions. And we're told to find a niche or something that we can sell or do on the side to make money and stay in business because profit margins have eroded to the point that simply filling prescriptions is no longer a sustainable model. And how sad is that? 
And how did, how did we ever get to this? Well, we got here because of no transparency and no accountability of the PBMs. And when you control the formulary, when you dictate the reimbursement rates, when you command the pharmacy network, and you can operate the whole show without transparency, then you can basically do whatever you want and say whatever you want. And I hear them say that, you know, changing this with the payers um, will hurt the payers or limiting that will drive up costs. Well, how is their current model working out? Drug costs continue to rise. Patient premiums are through the roof. I, we just heard from the previous people, I myself pay over $100,000 a year in premiums for my employees' health insurance. Um, and I did notice on a sidebar quickly when they talk about blaming the manufacturers for it that um, it's the PBMs that are negotiating and dealing with who will give them the best rebate to put them on the formulary. And in response, and I've listened to uh, Big Pharma talk about that, they're, they're increasing costs partly in response to be able to get on that formulary that the PBM's commanding and who's going to give the PBM the biggest rebate to get on their formulary. So I started sharing my story with, with, uh, about PBMs with my state senator and representatives over four years ago, um, currently with um, Senator Altman and Representative Wentworth. In that time, I know of several pharmacies from around the state that are no longer in business some of them that are in your district and some of them in others. And the gentleman from Spartan Nash, uh, in fact, those three stores up there in, in Mayo and West Branch, and the, uh, he was wanting this independent association to be formed a few years ago and, um, you know, and was wanting to be part of this and struggling and no longer in business. Um, this bill passed the House over three months ago with language for licensing to begin January of 2023. It was originally presented to be January of 22. But I'll tell you that every month and every year that passes without PBM transparency and accountability, the PBM's control continues to grow stronger, pharmacies get weaker, and patient costs continue to rise, and we can wait no longer. So I briefly just wanted to touch on the parts of the bill that you hear opposition on. Um, one of them in particular is Section 15 about prohibiting retroactive about fees. Two minutes left. Okay. Retroactive fees and charges and the adjudication. Um, I, can, I can resubmit this to you guys so that, that you can read great. it in its entirety and yeah, then possibly uh, locate with you guys through the, uh, <laughs> any opportunity between now and when you reconvene in the fall. Um, the main gist in kind of summarizing all of this, and I had a slide from, uh, from DIFFS, when he was talking about, there was a question the first week about if we did put in this legislation, would it save money? And this slide here was showing that um, when Joseph Sullivan gave his testimony two weeks ago that patients would be better off with this bill for the transparency and accountability it would bring and concluded it would drive down costs for the state. So section 17 prohibits spread pricing. And the best example I can give to support eliminating spread pricing has to do with what Vicki Cunningham did in West Virginia as a state Medicaid director when she carved out completely the pharmacy benefit managers and the Medicaid plans, saved the state of West Virginia over $54 million, and at the same time was able to provide $116 million in dispensing fees to the pharmacy while saving the state. And she was up here in Michigan. Um, we spent a day going around talking to the department, uh, MDHHS, and with some legislators uh, trying to get that in Michigan. So I'll skip over the purposes of defining the network pharmacy affiliated and non-affiliated, but the purpose of explaining that was to let you know that Section 19 that prevents a PBM from paying their PBM-owned a pharmacy more than a non PBO pharmacy allows for a um, level playing field and increased accessibility for the patients. You saw the example of how much they will pay their own pharmacies compared to um, uh, independent. So the last item I'm going to address is section 1620 or section 27, which is crucial to the proper reimbursement for pharmacies for stability and pricing. Pharmacies should not be reimbursed for a drug an amount that is less than the cost of a drug. And to state the obvious, a pharmacy needs to be reimbursed at a minimum the cost of the drug and the cost to dispense of the drug if a pharmacy is to remain viable. So this bill provides that protection by preventing PBMs from reimbursing pharmacies for drugs below the cost, and it does use the NADAC, which is updated weekly as a minimum standard for pricing. This method is already in use in several states, including Michigan, for their Medicaid programs by mandate of the Affordable Care Act, which states exactly to provide a more fairly reimbursed uh, to more fairly reimburse pharmacies for their prescription claims. So I'm going to close by saying, follow the money. 
over the last several years in the world of pharmacy, look at who is paying more, who is getting paid less, and who is profiting. Patients are surely paying more, pharmacies are definitely getting paid less, and PBMs have become very, very profitable. Just follow the money. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John, and I know we're, we're running out of town, I know, or time. Uh, Antonio C is on line two. If you could submit your testimony for us, that would be great. I know that uh, Peter Martz has also. Uh, here, here's for a question for all of you that are in the audience, and uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more about this, but we, also, we talk about PBMs. But we also know that PSAOs are involved with this process too, and I would certainly love to know what percentage they take on uh, reimbursements. I don't have time for an answer from you today, sure. but uh, would love to have that information passed back to me so that I can get it out to my committee. Um, but with that, we have to depart to get to uh, uh, session today, so without any other business to come before the committee without objection, the Senate Committee on Health Policy and Human Services is adjourned.